my mic was off. Happens to the best of us. Hello, everybody, <laughs> and welcome into Book Passage uh, and into Conversations with Authors. Uh, today, we bring to you uh, Colin Thubron uh, and the uh, are in his newest book, The Amer River. Uh, but before we get to our authors properly, allow me to, sp uh, to welcome you to Book Passages Conversations with Authors. Uh, if you've seen one of these events before, well then, welcome back. We're glad to see you again. Um, but if you're new here, then Book Passage is a group of independently run bookstores out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and we host and run book talks just like these very often throughout the week. And as we are now streaming on YouTube and doing these live, uh, and will continue to do so in the future, please consider subscribing by clicking the subscribe button just below the video. It supports us completely for free uh, and uh, allows us to know that we're doing a good job and uh, alerts you every single time we go live with one of these excellent events, particularly if you click the little subscription bell right next to the button. Uh, it allows you to know every time we go live or post some interesting author content as we do from time to time. Uh, if you'd like to find our upcoming events and don't like the idea of, ta uh, of clicking buttons on YouTube, uh, you can subscribe to our email newsletter, which you can find at bookpassage.com on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and if you'd like to check out tonight's book, which again is called The Amor River, uh, or anything else that happens to be mentioned here tonight, you can also find it all on bookpassage.com, or the book is linked in the very first link in the description box below the video. Uh, lastly, if you have any questions for tonight's speakers, please take the time to write them in the YouTube chat when you think of them. It is the only way to get your questions to the speak to the speakers, so don't miss your chance to do so. I'll take them and I'll copy them into the Zoom chat, uh, or at least I'll do my best to. We don't always get to every question, but regardless, everybody is always very happy that they're um, being asked. Now, allow me to introduce Colin Theron, who is the author of seven award-winning novels, including To the Last City, which was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. He is, he is an, an acknowledged master of travel writing, and his most recent titles include Behind the Wall, uh, uh, In Siberia, which won awards, and the New York Times bestseller Shadow of the Silk Road and um, To a Mountain in Tibet. In 2010, he became president of the Royal Society of Literature. In conversation tonight, we have Don George, who is the author of The Way of Wanderlust, uh, the Best Travel Writing of Don George and Lonely Planet's Guide to Travel Writing. He's the editor of 10 anthologies, including A Movable Feast, The Kindness of Strangers, Better Than Fiction, and Innocent Abroad. George is the editor-at-large for National Geographic Traveler, where he writes feature articles and the monthly triplet column. He is also the editor of BBC Travel's literary column magazine, Chance, or sorry, literary travel column, Chance Encounters. Uh, but uh, that's enough for me at this point so allow me to hand the show off to uh the more interesting folks colin don welcome thank you thank you nick thank you very much for that great introduction thank you book passage for hosting this conversation um and i just want to begin by saying colin how incredibly happy i am just to see your face <laughs> thank you well it's been a long time <laughs> it has been a long time Yes, I was. I checked my my records in 2013. I was sitting in your apartment in in London, but that was a long time ago. Uh, but seeing you makes me remember that with special warmth and fondness, and it's really wonderful to see you again. Well, thanks great. for I'm, joining. I'm glad us. I haven't got too much older in the interval. <laughs> you haven't at all. <laughs> um, and I, I also just want to say what, to my mind, an incredible triumph your new book is. I. I was truly in awe of your evocative descriptions and your ability to seamlessly weave all of your exhaustive research throughout your account. It's really, really an extraordinary book. And uh, I'd like to recommend that everyone who's watching today go out and buy and read it immediately, as soon as you can. Order it from Book Passage and, and read it. It's just really, a, it's a truly triumphant book. So um, such a pleasure. Thank you for writing it. Um, I do suspect that many of our viewers haven't yet had the experience of reading the book, so I thought I'd begin by just asking you to, to summarize, for those who haven't read it, to give a summary of, of what the book is all about. Well, the book is, uh, it's essentially about probably the longest river that nobody's ever heard of. It's uh, the Amur River, which is the 10th longest in the world. It's vast. It drains a basin twice the size of Pakistan. And just to locate it geographically, I suppose the 
easiest way is to say it's the border in the far east between Russia and China. In fact, it, um, it starts in Mongolia, ends in the Pacific, and has many other facets to it. But maybe we should call up a map at some mm. stage and, uh, and just so people can see where it begins and, and where it ends. Yeah, so should we do that now, Nick? Nick? Could you put could the map on? Now? It's up. Oh. Well, people will probably see in the far left-hand corner, the western corner, that it rises in the Mongolian mountains, which are sacred to Genghis Khan. He's buried there in an unknown grave to the um, fury of treasure seekers and archaeologists. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where he's buried, but this was his sacred land where he was born. And then the river moves into the Mongolian steppe, and people can probably just see where it crosses into southern Siberia. Um, I'll have a look myself at the map to remind myself what it looks like. Um, but it's, uh, it may be hard for people to see, but pretty soon it crosses into Siberia and makes an enormous loop. Um, and finally going uh, southeast there and ending um, up the, on the Chinese border, Khabarovsk. But it, during that loop, it, um, it eventually at the very top of the loop almost, it becomes the river Amur. Um, it's the Onon in Mongolia, which they say is the Holy Mother Onon, Mongolian mothers, uh, Mongolian mother, um, and they worship it as a, a, almost a, a sacred female river. Then it enters, Russia becomes the Shilka, and then finally on the Chinese border, it becomes the Amur and has a change of gender. It becomes male. The Russians call it the um, little father Amur, and the Chinese on their side call it the Heilongjiang, the Black Dragon River. And then you can probably see at the lowest point there, just as it begins to rise, Khabarovsk, which is the largest city uh, on the Amur, um, about half a million people. And then for its last 600 miles, it goes north, um, meets the Pacific, where you'll see the Okra Sea um, north of Japan. Um, the main area of it, that great slope um, from the, its summit uh, down to Khabarovsk is the Chinese border, um, the Russian-Chinese border, and it's probably the most heavily fortified border on Earth. So it's, that's the trajectory of the river, almost 3,000 miles in all, and yet to the Western gaze, it's almost unheard of, which is astonishing. Now this is an extremely remote area, very, very arduous travel. And so I was wondering, when, when did the idea for this trip and this book come to you? And what was the, the prime motivation for it, would you say? Well, um, I guess that most of my working life has been devoted to Central Asia, to Russia and to China. And this seemed a sort of natural convergence of these two great ex-communist giants, um, where they find their limit and their rather um, uh, tentative um, relationship across the river, if you can call it that. And so it seemed natural in a way to write a book about where those two powers um, literally meet, um, mm -hmm. which is, a, a, I suppose, was the crux of my interest. Um, mm -hmm. There are many interesting things about the river, of course, mm -hmm. and it's always attractive um, to be following a river it seems a natural sort of trajectory from its birth to its death. But the, um, the main interest, the crucial interest was that Russian-Chinese confrontation. Right, right. It's, it is fascinating as you trace it along the river. Um, mm. the, the, the fact that you had recently celebrated your 80th birthday before you set out on this journey give you any, any pause about going into such extremely remote places? Um, well, it should have done, <laughs> but oddly enough, it didn't. You know, I suppose I'm one of those people that don't feel at any age in particular. Right. You know, and I always feel that if I have an obsession about something, which was so in this case, that however fragile the body is, the sort of energy and the mind um, will drag the body along with it somehow, <laughs> and uh, that you'll get through. But um, I'm a little bit foolish. I have to say, in not recognizing what is comparative weakness now. 
Well, I'm glad you didn't because it's a fantastic book and it's an amazing journey. And, and I, I actually concur. I think one, that you're timeless and ageless and two, that your spirit and energy carries you through whatever physical difficulties you might have. So um, I'm so glad you did the trip and I'm so glad that you're, you feel that way about it. Uh, but it was a very rigorous trip. You, and physically as well as mentally, you had along the way, a couple of broken ribs and a broken ankle. I'm, I'm wondering if there were any moments when you felt like giving up. Uh, not really. Um, the, the worst of those physical injuries came when in the Mongolian marshes. The river rises in a, a sort of forbidden area of Mongolia. You have to get special permission. And I went with a couple of, a couple of horsemen and a guide. And we finally found the source of the river, which is out in an area that was there have been heavy monsoons there that year. This is um, 2018, and it was marshy. We were told it was treacherous, we shouldn't go. Um, we had uh, signed documents with the rangers which absolved them of any responsibility for us. <laughs> but we went, and um, yes, I was thrown from the horse several times. They floundered in the marshes. They hated this terrain. Um, they panicked and rolled, and um, they were used to the hard Mongolian steppe not to this marshland. And so I came out, yes, pretty damaged. I, I had, yeah, I had fractured ribs and a, a broken ankle, but I persuaded myself that the ankle was only sprained and the ribs were only bruised and carried on. You know, it was just <laughs> foolish optimism, if you like. But, but what do you do? You come out of the marshes and you go back, I suppose, was the option to go back to Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia. You get x-rayed, they find they're all broken. Um, you go back to London and you lose an entire year um, of travel and of your life. And at my age, um, I can't afford to lose a year. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll carry on. Wow. Well, I think you personify intrepidness with that. And, and you persevered and you, you, you did not end up having any lasting physical problems from this, I believe. Is that, is that true? That's true. The ankle healed uh, fairly well. It didn't have to be broken and reset. When I got back to London, of course, it was x-rayed and everybody was very gloomy about it, but I was told <laughs> it's better, better not to have it um, meddled with. It had mended fairly well. It was the oh. fibula if anybody that's interested in ankles, mm -hmm. um, which is the lesser ankle bone, and it had knit quite well. And ribs, I think you can't do anything about ribs anyway, except not laugh or or, or cough. And I didn't have a cough and there wasn't much to laugh about. So I got, got on with it. it was the ideal circumstances for you. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> As a writer, I was reading your book thinking, how in the world are you taking notes under these incredibly rigorous and demanding circumstances? Can you talk a little bit about that process, how you do that out in the field? Yeah, I mean, I started travel writing in the 1960s when there was no technology in particular for taking notes except a notepad and a pen. And that's what I've stuck with. Um, you just have to find intervals of rest at some stage. And um, the, these, this was its hardest in Mongolia because I was in pain and I was dog tired. We all were, even the horsemen said it was the worst journey they'd ever done. You know, they'd throw themselves into that tent at night with their boots still on. And uh, so that um, was, uh, you know, I would scribble notes, incoherent notes, but usually um, I found time perhaps in the evenings and the notes, um, they are crucial to the book. Um, I don't like taking so many notes because it makes the journey so self-conscious but I've never been able to get around that because the notes are important to me. My memory is average and I would forget all the details of things if I didn't write them down. You know, you, of course, you always remember more or less what a landscape looked like. I'd take a photograph even, or how somebody spoke in a, a you know, you would, that, the generality of a conversation, but you wouldn't remember the precise words they'd used. You wouldn't remember quite the texture of a landscape, how, how it struck you. So in the end, um, it's always the notes that I go back to when I come to write the book. And without them, um, I'd be lost. Of course, it makes you very vulnerable because if your notes get confiscated or lost or stolen along the way, uh, there'd be no book. 
but um, I've been lucky so far. Mm. Wow, are you, are, how many notebooks did you fill, if I may ask? Well, <laughs> my writing is horribly small. <laughs> um, so I only, you know, only about sort of four little uh, squidgy notebooks with very narrow lines on them. Um, wow. People can't read my writing. I'm, I have a hard time <laughs> if I lift it too long. My, my nice American editor used to say I had a box, a sort of matchbox full of ants, which I trained to dip in ink and run across the page because he couldn't ever understand a word of the notes I had. But that was a, a long time ago. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, that makes perfect sense. So do you also take a lot of photographs as well? I do, but um, you'll be surprised how, and I'm a bit surprised about how useless they are compared to the written notes. Somehow it's the choice of words while you're actually in the situation, talking to somebody, confronting a landscape or a building, undergoing some experience. It's always, to me, it's the choice of words that you use and get down that, that have been most um, potent for me in, in writing. So the photographs, yes, they, they have helped, but um, less than you think. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I always find that half a year later when I'm trying to recall what happened on that trip, just reading a passage or two or three instantly transports me back there in a way that even looking at a photograph doesn't. There's just something yeah. about the, the words as portals that, that really work powerfully. Yes, that include, of course, the remembrance of sound, conversation, right. uh, of scent, even of smell, and above all, a sort of feeling, atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, in addition to all of those wonderful details, your book is also, as always, as always in your writing, it's layered and enriched with rigorous and, and sometimes really truly arcane scholarship. And I'm wondering how you went about putting all of that research together, um, how far in advance of the trip you began to research and how did you even just go about the process of doing the research? Well, um... It's done back in England, of course. I go to the School of Oriental Studies or the British Museum Library. And um, well, uh, I usually try to start with a travel book and I did with this one at least a year and a half before traveling so that you know what piques your interest most, what seems most important along the way. Of course, you have to keep flexible. Um, you can't always know how things are going to pan out. But um, the research is very important for me in that way. But above all, in this case, it was amendments of language um, because my Mandarin, such as it ever was, um, is very poor. And I needed to kind of revive it um, in order to travel on the Chinese side of the river. And my Russian, which is better, um, I needed to keep that um, in some sort of trim too. Um, both these languages, it sounds as if, you know, the that they are in their different ways very difficult languages and I certainly don't speak them remotely well but um, that was part of the research to, to, to recover the language. The other part, um, it's odd, I mean, there's not a great deal written on the Amur, there's quite a lot that's a, a scholarship, you might say academic scholarship, um, which has been very useful but there always comes a time for me when I want to stop the research, I feel I'm taking on other people's views too much. Um, I want to keep my mind, if possible, um, flexible and open to something different. And I certainly don't want to lay my own agenda upon where I am. And um, too much research can, um, can make that happen if you're not careful. That always comes a time in research where I say, okay, that's enough, I'm gonna go now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's fascinating. And you just feel that. You, you just kind of know that you've hit that point. Yeah, yeah it's just a sort of instinct somehow. Um, you feel you've come to the end of the really useful research. You can always go on forever. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> now it's time to get there and start experiencing yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. How did you keep your, how did you revive your Mandarin? Oh, good question. Um, I went to a, a, a sort of night school in London initially, um, which was a bit dismal because um, it was too elementary for me. And I thought, well, I'll just use 
um, tapes and remember the sounds and the, and the vocabulary with um, sort of updated uh, recordings and CDs of Chinese. So I use those in the end. Mm. And I've got enormous language manuals for when I originally learned and um, my, my own um, written phrase books and things. <laughs> And so I went back to those with a rather despairing feeling that I was not recovering as much as I should have done. So that's what I did. Well, I, I think it's exemplary that you put that effort into learning the languages, Russian and Mandarin both, um, you know, demanding languages so that you can have a, a deeper travel experience. I just think that's truly inspiring that you, that you did that. Um, one question I did have, in terms of the actual writing of the book itself is you, you wrote the book in the present tense. And I was curious how you decided to, to do that. Hmm. It's interesting. It's again, it's another of those rather instinctive reactions I have. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I, I don't mm -hmm. know, except it seemed appropriate to the material. Maybe mm -hmm. because so much of it had a kind of immediacy. Um, right which I wanted to convey. Um, I think that's all I can say about it because mm -hmm. I could just as well have written it in the past, um, yeah. but it came up that occasionally, I think there are little passages in the past which may relate a bit more to history or something, right. but certainly everything personal um, is in the present. Yeah, well, it does make it feel incredibly present. And, right. and because, you, <laughs> because you're going through so many Kind of extraordinary landscapes and encounters it did give it it gave it a kind of a momentum and an urgency i felt that was really really compelling for me as a reader well i'm glad you found that because that was the intention and and, and the instinct was to because the, i had a sufficient number of other extraordinary and quite tense experiences um that made me think um this is the right tense for the yeah yeah. I always think of a travel book as, as two journeys. There's the journey that the book describes, and then there's also the journey of the writing of the book. And I'm wondering, what were the biggest challenges of each of those journeys for you? The actual journey and then the writing journey. Oh, enormous subject, Don. Um, <laughs> I think the, the challenge of the journey, mainly to me, or at least this is what I thought was going to be the challenge, was to travel on the Chinese side of the river. I'd never read of anybody who'd done it or spoken or heard of anybody who had done it. I'd only heard vague rumors that the Chinese side of the river was bristling with arms, just as the Russian side was and has been um, for decades. So I thought I'd be turned back very likely on the Chinese side or arrested. Um, I thought I wouldn't be allowed along it. Um, and that was the main challenge I thought for the future. There were other challenges like finding the river. I knew um, on horseback, although I have used to ride a bit as a child, that it was not going to be the easy. Um, you know, there were 10 days of really heavy marsh riding um, was one of the worst, um, probably the worst experience in a sense because it inflicted physical injury and, um, uh, and wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't what I planned. So I think those were the two main things. As it turned out, uh, the Chinese side was not too bad. Um, I kept expecting a roadblock, something to happen. But no, whereas the Russian side is bristling with arms and there's a double rank of barbed wire with raked earth in between to betray the passage of anybody crossing and watchtowers at every few intervals. On the Chinese side, there's very little, just the odd white watchtower all along which you see, they are watching, but they're not as afraid as the Russians are that there may be infiltration coming from the north. So um, that, was, uh, that was a great a, a, a great boon for me. The other challenge I think was to, I wanted to experience fishing on the river and I wasn't sure how to do that. There's a lot of poaching um, and a certain, you know, they're just not used to foreigners appearing. Um, out of the blue and wanting to share <laughs> right. their experience. Occasionally they have big time fishermen who you know, hire, hire a company to take them salmon fishing or something. 
but for somebody just wanting to embed themselves in a fishing village and um, not only to experience the fishing, but even to sort of see a bit of their lives and the lives of native peoples along the river, because there are these mongoloid people which you barely, um, barely hear about, who are the little peoples, as the Russians call them, um, who still live there. And uh, I was mainly among a people called the Uchi, who have a special reverence for bears, which in, in itself is very interesting. <laughs> and so that was a challenge too. Those were the main challenges of the journey. The challenges of writing, um, that's, um, that's harder to say. It was almost uniform, I think. Um, I always find writing hard. Um, it was simply um, less, I think, recapturing um, the moments of tension. Um, you know, when I was arrested, I was pretty much had written down and was sure of um, the dialogue between myself and the police and so on. Um, and those things weren't so difficult. It was the writing of the research, I think, when terribly wanted to be crisp and um, for it to feel uh, important and not pedantic and real and not be too long. I was constantly trying to shorten what some people might find obscure research. After all, nobody's heard of this river to start with. <laughs> um, so uh, that was a challenge, um, not, not to be laboured with the research, not to give a sense of the strain. And also it's always with travel writing a, a challenge to get passages to link together. You know, basically you're dealing with a series of incidents. You know, you're setting out, your, your horse throws you down. Then you want a passage about Genghis Khan perhaps and where he's buried or not. Um, then comes a landscape description, then uh, a conversation with one of the horsemen and so on. And they're, in a way, they're all part of a unity, but they're not actually easily linked together. It's important to try to get those sort of seamless so the book doesn't seem to jerk along and just be and then happen and then this happened and then that happened. That's terribly tedious. Mm. So the challenge for me is often to, to weave the separate pieces together into some sort of unity. Uh, yes, that's, that's the huge challenge, I think. And um, you did it magnificently in this book. And I'm wondering, how do you, I guess I have two questions. One is, there's so many experiences. A, a book like this could be as long as, as War and Peace, easily. <laughs> and how, how do you decide, how do you edit reality? How do you decide what to put in and what not to put in? And then how do you make those transitions, those links as a writer? Well, in, in my case, a lot of it is decided on the road. You sort of know instinctively when a conversation's important or has some interest. Um, and then you write it up fully as you, fully as you can, as quickly after the conversation as you can. Um, and you know, as the conversation goes sometimes, maybe we have, I find myself some, sometimes having quite casual some conversation with, then something sometimes click. You say, this is interesting. Um, and in that awful journalistic phrase, you say, I can use this. And you do, <laughs> right. you know, because in a sense you are, it, on that sort of journalistic mission by which you're looking for material. It sounds very unromantic, but that's what you're doing. And so um, an awful lot of what I put in or exclude is there already um, on, in, in the notes. In mm -hmm. The uninteresting conversations are simply not there. Mm -hmm. And so all that has sort of happened for you, not all, but most of the deciding of what's important has happened previously. Mm -hmm. um, on the journey. So when I settle down to write, um, it's, there's not much in the notebooks that gets left out. Mm. Wow. So the narrative is really taking shape as you're going along it and is. you're making oh. these decisions. This, this is yeah. going to be in the book. This is not going to be in the book. Yeah. And sometimes you feel, oh, you know, um, when I read the notes, I think, oh, this isn't too bad. I could write it, just write it out of the notebooks but you can't somehow, it just doesn't have it. It's not in the proper language. It's not, a, it's not fluent, it's not succinct. Um, it's a sort of mass of impressions and details and so on. 
which makes sense to me, but they wouldn't to a reader. Mm. So they always need that um, refinement. And how about the layering, the idea of, oh, now I've got to get Genghis Khan in. This is the place to get that piece of history in. Or there was that interesting book that I read. There was that passage in that book that this is the place to put that in. How does that magic happen? Uh, that too um, is, it's usually fairly apparent in your narrative uh, where something like that will happen. I mean, well, we were floundering through the marshes um, near um, Khan Khinti, which is supposedly the mountain that was sacred to Genghis Khan, which he worshipped and would sometimes return to from his campaigns to um, receive inspiration and power from this mountain. Obviously, while we're in that vicinity, it was a time for um, writing about him and his grave, which is supposedly there. Nobody knows really where it is. Um, and archaeologists have completely failed to detect it. Um, the Mongols themselves concealed it. In fact, they ran horses over the grave, said it would never be, never be apparent to anybody. Mm. And it said that those who were complicit in the burial were all executed. So nobody would know um, where he was and all that. So um, those sort of things happen probably because of the geography, because of where you are and where the history most potently is. That, that's usually how it happens. Mm -hmm. Right, so in this kind of a chronological narrative, geographical narrative, those decisions are almost made by the location, for example. Yes, they are pretty much. Occasionally, something is made, a piece of history perhaps is made because of something that's occurred in conversation with somebody, but much less likely. Almost always because you're in this place, you're in this monastery, say, um, so a few words about Mongolian Buddhism um, become appropriate as you're talking with the monk. Right, right. What were the biggest surprises of the trip for you? Ooh. <laughs> That's difficult. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it was surprising. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, sorry, I'm just I think um, the surprise, the happy surprise, was that I could go along the Chinese shore mm. and I was only arrested once and for a very short time. Um, so, because if I hadn't been able to sort of find the Chinese shore and portray it and have some sense of it and what Chinese were feeling, um, I think there couldn't have been a book there. It would have always struck me as a one-sided book to write about only the Russian and Mongolian side. So <clears throat> that was the happy surprise. Um, the unhappy surprises were, um, well, um, in a way, it was good copy, you might say. But um, I found myself by pure fluke. Um, I woke up in a, in a Mon Mongolian monastic um, guest house on urine stained blankets and feral dogs on the outside loo and so on. And all night, um, military vehicles have been passing this curtainless window um, for hour after hour after hour. And um, in the morning, the valley around me was pouring out smoke and there was gunfire. And um, I rang up my wife and um, just to reassure her saying, I'm here and everything's fine. She said, where are you exactly? I'm saying a place called Sugol. And she had been reading New York Times and said, well, you're, you're in the middle of the biggest joint Russian-Chinese military exercise that there's been for 40 years. There are 300,000 men deployed. And you don't know anything about it. And so much of the, so much of the traveler having first had knowledge. But here it was, I was caught um, in the middle of this massive um, engagement. And uh, I, it, it was worrisome. I mean, the lone monk um, who I'd been staying with said, he had a rather bad sense of humor, I thought, because he said, if they, um, if they find your English, uh, they'll put you in prison. He found this terribly funny. <laughs> and then, but then he found a, an old fellow with a cracked larder um, car to get me out of it. And we did find our way out of it eventually, actually taking the car through the Russian camp and then the Chinese camp without a sentry to stop us. 
and got out the other way. It was pure luck, but that was a very unpleasant surprise momentarily. Um, it was very interesting, but it was, it was unpleasant. And of course, um, I wasn't surprised to be arrested on the Russian side much later, um, sort of provincial police, who I think were honestly uh, bewildered by a foreigner um, in such a remote part of the land. They sort of get nervous that it's their territory and they have to check up on you and, and grill you and, and pop you in a cell for a few hours, um, which is what happened. I think they were just bewildered by a, a, a rather old man with bad Russian and a limp, as I had by then, um, <laughs> wandering about with ill-equipped for spying. I was very darn at heel. <laughs> so you know, um, the, these were unpleasant, but of course that is interesting also. Um, I can't say that I had any really nasty shocks um, otherwise, they were shocks that you know you could cope with, and right. uh, sometimes write about. What were you expecting, or were you expecting? Did you have expectations before the trip about how you how the Russians would be feeling about the Chinese, and how the Chinese would be feeling about the Russians? What were you expecting, and and what did the reality turn out to be? Um, I was expecting. Um, I. I think the main thing that um, surprised me was uh, the sort of recent development of the imbalance between the Russian and Chinese currencies. Um, the, I'd read a lot about Chinese infiltration into Russia. Um, after all, you've got a situation in which on the um, Amur border, the Russian border, you've got 2 million inhabitants. On the Chinese border, you've got 110 million. And so the Russians are naturally nervous. And I had expected um, more Chinese presence on the Russian side. Um, and the Russians I knew were, um, well, they were anxious about the Chinese and didn't like them. Um, there was always this um, uh, denoting of them as locusts or the ants, as swarms of people coming over, depersonalized really, um, coming over the river and doing trade and buying up farmland and so on. And so that I was expecting. Um, on the Chinese side, it was more opaque um, as exactly what they were thinking about the Russians, except um, what I found was um, a certain despisal of the Russians for being so incompetent in, in business. And on the Russian mm -hmm. side, the feeling that the Chinese worked hard, but as they said, they have closed hearts, the Russians used to say. Huh. Um, so mm, a lot of my expectations were fulfilled. But what I wasn't expecting was such a retreat of Russians from the Chinese, of Chinese from the Russian side. They were in the markets um, and they were monopolizing the markets in the larger cities, um, producing all the domestic goods that the Russians are so bad at. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, um, I, I was taken aback a bit. I, years ago, I remember seeing quite a lot of Russian and um, a lot of Chinese and Korean farming on the Russian side of the river. And I think there was less of that they tend, Chinese tend to own land, maybe it's said, and certainly um, where the Russians um, feel a foreboding about it, the Russians in that area, it's because of the gas that's being extracted, the oil that's mm. been extracted, and for, above all for the timber that is being felled by Russians in league with Chinese entrepreneurs and sawmills. So all that was very interesting and largely expected, but not the, not the sort of standoff quite as it's been with the Chinese retreat. And um, the Chinese simply say, you know, we can't, the, the Russians say we can't buy, in it, buy anything on the Chinese side, so we can't afford to be there. The Chinese on the far side, even the farmers would say, well, there's, you know, we can't sell our stuff. The ruble means nothing compared to the Chinese yuan. Ah, yeah, that's that's really fascinating. The whole dynamic of how the two cultures interact with each other, the way you bring it out in the book was was really fascinating to me. I 
very educational. Um, I, I do want to pause for a second and, and invite viewers to send questions, to write their questions in, and, and Nick can convey those questions to me. So if you have a question for Colin, please, please type it in and, uh, and I'll make sure to try to find time to ask it. Colin, I actually wanted to, before time ran out, get, pull back and ask you one sort of more broad question about your career, all of your wonderful books. I'm, I'm wondering if you feel that your writing and your approach to writing has changed during the, the course of your career, and, and if so, how has it changed? Oh, <laughs> it's changed slowly, I think, is the answer. Um, my writing, it's typical, you know, my younger writing is a little bit more extravagant, a little more purple, <laughs> a little more elaborate. <laughs> Um, and occasionally more fanciful. Um, and my later writing, um, I think slowly has become more economical, more refined. I like to think so. Um, I think when you're young, you know, the imagination is perhaps in full flood and the critical faculty is not quite so sharp. <laughs> As you get older, it's possible the imagination fades a bit, I'm afraid. Um, but the critical faculty, I think, goes on fighting at you. And um, I think that's probably happened with me. Um, I like to think that the writing got better. Um, it may have pretty much stayed the same for many books, but I had a sort of crisis um, in, I guess it was the late 1970s, 78. Up to then, I had written four books and they were all on the Middle East, um, on Damascus, Jerusalem, uh, Cyprus, the Lebanon, um, small areas, um, you know, the Lebanon and, and Cyprus are both very small. Um, and I felt a sort of confidence, perhaps, that I could take on a small place, but not a larger place, that I could more or less research everything significant about it, which I couldn't, but I thought I could. And um, so those books were more concentrated on a small area. And then in 1978, I had a bad car accident and was lying in bed um, with a broken back, um, waiting for it to heal. And I often found that enforced leisure is rather creative in my case, and my mind was going sort of crazy. I was probably, you know, um, on drugs or something. Um, and I suddenly conceived of traveling into Russia on a, by car, which is a very odd thing to conceive in those days. This was Brezhnev's Soviet Union. Um, anyway, that's eventually what I did. And those books were a bit different. They were on big areas, as my later books have all been on Central Asia, on China, on Russia, even the Amur River, it's an enormous area. Um, and they're more ambitious, but they're less dependent, certainly less dependent on feeling I know everything. Um, and I obviously know that I don't, but the writing I think has changed um, perhaps because of that, that um, it's more, the material perhaps is more crucial than it used to be, um, that it, it seems to be more, more important, more vital. Mm -hmm. And that has steered the writing so much. Mm -hmm. ah, that's great. Um, let's, let's see, there is a question from a viewer, Judy, who said, how, who asks, how long did the journey take and how many miles were covered? And what was the mode of transportation other than horseback? <laughs> a good question. Um, uh, the, the journey took about five months, um, but it was broken in two because um, as you read the book, if you do, um, there's a winter comes on, the Amur freezes up completely. Um, it's not just hard, harder to travel along, but it's more, uh, everything closes up. Um, people themselves are less, um, are less communicative, I think, um, or might be. And certainly to be on fishing on the river, which is what I wanted to do, I had to delay until the next spring. So it was about perhaps three months and then two months. As for distance, it was nearly 3,000 miles. And after the horse, horse tribulations um, <laughs> in Mongolia, I was hitchhiking quite a lot, which in Russia can be wonderful because you meet very generous and, and um, uh, sort of intriguing people. So much of that was by, by hitchhike, then a bit by 
cab, you know, you pick up a, a, a rather battered old cab, which will take you on for very little money. Um, those were the ways, and by boat at one time um, in the middle of the river, then uh, on the Trans-Siberian Railway where it traveled, it bends in a great arc following the river southeast. And then um, on the Chinese side by buses, underpowered buses, which were going along um, the river. Uh, that was almost the only way one could go. And then back on the Russian side, it was by boat largely again. I'm still kind of, I'm astonished and inspired by the image of you doing all of these things. Um, you know, at your very young 80 years old, but to be standing by the side of the road hitchhiking or, you know, you know arranging to get a ride with someone and jumping on ferries and all the things that you did is truly, truly inspiring. Well, it, 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 um, it didn't feel like hitchhiking, you know, I was in a Don Beat Hotel where I met a couple of wonderful Russians who became just interested in my journey. And um, they took me to some of the more obscure areas of the river where I wouldn't have been, it would have been very hard to go otherwise, and so on. So um, it, it, I wasn't usually literally on the roadside. Right. <laughs> I was a bit, once or twice, but mainly not. Right. What do you think are the characteristics that you meet so many people during the course of your book and they open up to you and it's, it becomes an incredibly enriching part of the book. What is it that you bring to the world or to life or to people that encourages them to, to open up to you and, and to take you out of their way a lot on these tortuous journeys to show you communities that you wouldn't otherwise have the chance to see? How, how does that happen? Well, I think, I think for one thing, you're an oddity, you know, um, you're a lone Westerner traveling in parts that Westerners just don't go. And so um, Russians in particular become intrigued by you and they want, particularly if you're alone, um, they're likely to approach you. If you're with one other person, say, of your own culture, they possibly would leave you alone a bit more. Mm. But when you're on your own, they think you're probably lonely and you need a vodka. So they, um, <laughs> they'll join up. Um, I think that's one thing. The other thing, um, which I regret a little, um, I have to say, is that you're clearly old um, and people are more prone to want to help you, I think. Um, I never think of myself as old, but I am. <laughs> and um, you suddenly realize you're, you're tottering along sometimes. And you, it's... Uh, it, it's um, quite sweet the way one or two um, Russians in particular um, were apt to want to help me, I think. Mm. And so it became a plus in some ways. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I don't think you're old, <laughs> by <laughs> the way. <laughs> um, well, um, <laughs> considering I'm as old as I am, I'm quite stupid. <laughs> Um, one viewer asked, how did you pay for supplies and guides along the way? Um, well, basically, I didn't have guides to speak of. I had to on the Mongolian side, and the supplies were packed on nine very wild horses that we took with us. Um, otherwise, um, you simply have to take what you can, where you can. It's no good carrying supplies. I mean, I... I did a little bit, but you know, a packet of biscuits or something, you usually land up somewhere um, with people who will be pleased probably to have a meal with you or feed you. Um, and uh, on odd shops, there are always usually village shops. It's pretty poor fare very often. Um, on the Chinese side, I was amazed to find restaurants in all the towns that had sprung up along the Amur River on their side. Um, 35 years ago, when I was last seriously in China, I don't remember the restaurants. It seemed as if, the, or not any good ones, it seemed as if the cuisine had died out, um, the art of cuisine, but now it's back. And um, as for guides, um, I had a Chinese companion rather than a guide who was recommended to me by a Russian friend on the other side who said, you must take somebody with you on the Chinese side, otherwise you'll be cheated and so on and so on. So I was glad to have this man with me for much of the way. 
but otherwise um, you don't really have guides, you, you go alone. I was keen at the last to find somebody who would help me with finding fishing. Um, I'm a fisherman and poachers. And so I went online at that stage and found a splendid character um, who normally was a, a guide for big time fishermen um, coming out from Moscow. But he also did um, eccentric people like me from time to time. And uh, so here I was lucky with, I just took a risk on him online and he proved splendid. But most of the time, um, you don't have a guide. Right. And I imagine you're, you're simply paying for things as you, as you go along. Did, did you start out with a wad of, of currency, the Chinese and Russian currency, or yeah. how did you do that? Um, yes, yes, you have to. In, you're hidden away in different parts of your, your body and your rucksack, <laughs> and you just hope you're not going to be badly burgled. Um, but you have a card, too. I mean, cards work in, in uh, some of these you know, uh, uh, little debit card and uh -huh. it's funny that you can put this in a slot in some barren uh, Russian Siberian town and it probably works or often does uh -huh. you clear it with your bank before you leave England wow that's fascinating um, you, William Dalrymple <clears throat> excuse me, writing in the Telegraph, William Dalrymple called you Britain's greatest living travel writer. And I would like to extend that to say you're probably the English language's greatest living travel writer. And I'm wondering when you, when you look around at the landscape of travel writing today, what do you think about where travel writing is going? And are there any writers that you feel especially excited about? Well, that's a very flattering description of me. <laughs> and of course, uh, the generation of fine travel writers older than me have mostly died. You know, Patrick Lee Fermer, Jan Morris, and, and so on, uh, Bruce Chatwin. Um, the future travel writing is quite difficult to say because the kind of journey I did in the Amur River um, is very, um, it's slightly controversial. You know, the white, the male, white, educated person going, um, and seeing people uh, much less privileged than himself and writing about them. It smacks of neo-colonialism. And so um, you have to be careful uh, mm -hmm. of that. Um, I mean, I think it can be an exaggerated critique of the genre, uh, that particular um, uh, schema. But um, the future is hard, I think, um, because the world has shrunk. And people do feel they know it much better because they can meet it online. Um, it's an illusion. I mean, really, you have to be in a place and live in it um, and travel in it in order to really understand it. So to just look at a map or a, a program and think that gives you the same thing mm. is really a, a bad illusion. I mean, bad in the sense that even politically, um, sitting in the White House or 10 Downing Street, thinking you can change the world by doing this or doing that without having in your, in your psyche any idea of the kind of culture you're approaching it is very dangerous. So um, it, travel writing remains in its way extremely important, um, but it may well be that in the future there will be much more kind of in-depth travel writing, for instance, somebody settling in a certain place or a certain more confined area. Um, travel writing too, um, combined with ecological concerns, with nature. Um, travel writing can go in, it's a very flexible genre, it can go in all sorts of different ways. And the sort of classic travel book, with the person that goes on an on a, um, adventurous journey and comes back and tell his tale, um, won't always be the the obvious genre, I think, it will um, travel writing itself will um, migrate into all sorts of other areas. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Are, are there any writers that you feel especially excited about or, or are branching off in interesting ways? There should be. And um, I'm ashamed to say that I've read so little recently, you get so obsessed mm -hmm. with your own work that you're right. almost reluctant to read anybody else. 
and you feel it will um, affect you, maybe mm -hmm. when you don't want to be affected, for good or bad. Um, that, that there are those, um, there's, for instance, a woman called Kapfa Kasabava, um, who's a very fine writer who's written on the area of her background, um, Bulgaria um, and uh, what is now Montenegro, uh, Croatia, or that part of the world. And that she brings a sort of an in-depth knowledge of um, because of her past experience and her family experience mm -hmm. and is a good writer. Um, she is one, of course, um, one who both is a naturalist and a travel writer is Robert McFarlane, who may be more familiar to you in, in the States, yeah. mm -hmm. um, who's written uh, wonderful books, which are basically um, travel books, many of them. And so those two spring to mind, but there are others, well, they, they're there. So long as people want to travel, um, they will write travel books. And as long as people want to read travel, which they do still, particularly in this country, perhaps, um, so the genre will go on. Yeah, great, thank you. What, what do you hope people will, going back to your, your current wonderful book, what do you hope readers will take away from it? Oh, well, I don't think they'll take away any yearning to follow my first <laughs> <laughs> So um, <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, I hope they'll um, become aware um, I don't write with any evangelical sense that I want to teach people this or teach people that. I just don't um, feel that in my bones. Um, mm. I write selfishly in many ways to satisfy personal curiosity and the mm. sort of love. But um, I would hope that they would, um, this book would give people a sense of a part of the world they've never heard about really. I mean, so many people in the West, particularly in England that I speak to, have never heard of the Amur River. It's the, here it is, it's the 10th longest river in the world. Some people say the eighth, um, and yet it's almost unknown. And it's very important. And I'd like people to be aware of it um, and to have their, their mental map of the world filled out a little by it. And also to realize that um, the relations between the Chinese and Russians um, are you know, the political relations which we all read about, that Moscow and Beijing are in harmony and so on, it's a little more complex than that. And when Russians and Chinese literally meet uh, where their border collides, um, the feelings are very different. Yeah, no, I, I love the way that you humanize that relationship, and, and especially that you hum humanize it out in the hinterlands where as you say, it's clearly so very different from what the official worldview or the official message that Beijing and Moscow would like you to hear. When you get out among the people, it's an entirely different message that you find. Yes, on, on both sides it is. Yeah. And the Chinese still resent, and um, well, there are those Chinese who resent the Russian seizure of all the Chinese lands north of the Amura, which happened in 1858 in the Treaty of Aigun, um, the Chinese have never actually um, acknowledged that treaty. They've always said, defined it as unequal. In other words, they defined the Treaty of the British in Hong Kong and say, um, and all the concessions which the old imperial predators wrenched from China in the 19th century and, and afterwards. So um, you know, all these powers like my own, the British, have given back to China um, the colonies that they seized. Um, only the Russians have never given back the enormous territories that they usurped um, in the mid 19th century. And the Chinese, although officially the border is sealed and settled, um, the Chinese haven't forgotten that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna ask one last question. And, and I apologize, this is a bit broad, Colin, but um, looking back on all your travels and writings, I'm wondering what are the, what's the biggest lesson that you've taken away, if I may ask, from, from your career? And really, I'm, I'm wondering what wisdom could you pass on to someone like me who's still trying to figure out what, what it's all about? What, 
what have you taken away <laughs> from your from your life and career? Oh, Don, I'm I'm not good at wisdom. Um, <laughs> I'm about as foolish as I always was. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, one would love to feel um, I could put into words some su succinct um, something that I've learned, but I, I could only say that I think travel itself um, is a vital element um, has been in my life and that without really knowing it or being aware of it, your view of the world um, is, is broadened and complexified, if I could use a terrible word, um, it, it's nuanced, um, it has to change, it has to have change when in a certain way. Um, I mean, I don't feel um, fiercely polemical about people having to travel. Mm -hmm. um, most people can't, um, as I do, and um, one feels very lucky in that way. But I think um, it, 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 does, um, it does affect people. I often feel I know when people are widely traveled or when they're not um, in conversation with them. And uh, it, it's good, I think, if people can manage it. I know this is a very superior way of looking at travel. Uh, most people can't. They've got family. They um, have a limited time in which to, to travel. They can't just go off. So I know this is a very privileged attitude, but um, I think travel holds an importance in the world. Otherwise, I suppose I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, thank you. Th those, are, those are great words of wisdom. <laughs> um, and just thank you, Colin, for, for this wonderful interview. Thank you for your wonderful book. Thank you for all the amazing books you've written. And you're really, for me personally, a huge inspiration as a, as a traveler and as a writer. Um, so thank you very, very much for everything you've given me and you've given all of us who are watching today. No, thank you. And thank you, Don. Um, I don't know what to say about all that, but uh, <laughs> it's been good to talk to you and to whoever is listening. Yeah, thanks. Right. Nick, we'll turn it back to you. All righty then. Oh, I have it set so that I don't show up on the screen. That's very unfortunate. One second. Aha, there I am. Hello. Um, thank you to everybody that happened to be here uh, for uh, for the uh, the talk today. Uh, I'm I'm glad that so many of you were speaking in the chat, including a number of people that uh, came in from London. Um, uh, always very pleasant to see people from all over the world. But to everybody that has the ability, again, the book is the Amur River. Uh, you can order it from Book Passage via the description and the link just below the video, um, and we'll ship it to your house, just like any other online online retailer in the world, uh, including the one which shall not be named. Um, Thank you again for coming out. If you want to support the channel, you can do it for free by clicking the subscribe button below. We do content just like this many, many times a week, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and uh, if you subscribe to us, you'll be alerted every time that we happen to go live. In addition to that, because of the wonderful, wonderful beauty of YouTube, if you happen to miss the beginning of this conversation and you'd like to go back, you could do that right now if you want. You can just click that red bar on the bottom of the screen, like just down here-ish, and just go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, well, not all the way to the beginning you go to, to about seven minute mark when we actually start the video uh and you can watch it all the way from the beginning as many times as you like you can get all that knowledge into your brain um but other than that this has been very nice it's been conversations with uh authors i'm very very glad to have you here today thank you one last time to don and colin for having such a lovely conversation and thank you to all of you out there in the wide world big the great wide world for supporting stores just like us I really do hope to see you in the next one.